Well, hi, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Good to be with you. Let's pray, and then we'll get into God's word. Father God, we praise and thank you. Thank you for your word. We are reminded. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And it's so true, Lord. And we need it in this time of darkness and this time of uncertainty. We pray that you would speak to us, illuminate, uh, illuminate us, and feed our spirits, Lord, with your word, that we may just find strength and courage, hope, and um, and the the spirit that we need to rise up above the the dark spirits and the and the assaults that uh, are coming on us in, this, in these perilous days. So bless our time. We ask in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are up to Exodus chapter 10, and uh, I don't think it's in our notes, but the title of the study that I've chosen for today is God is for us. God is for us, because quite often, if you look in the scriptures at the stories and the battles that the Israelites go through, God is not really on the ground walking with feet and fighting with his hands. We know as we look back on the stories that he's with us. He's always been with us. And uh, But when you go through trials, often he's silent or hidden. And, uh, and that makes it uh, a challenge for us because, you know, we, we walk by faith. It's all about walking by faith. It's like walking on water. And uh, and it's a vulnerable walk that we walk. The story of the Exodus coming out of Egypt, and we're right at the climax where Moses is in involved in spiritual warfare. <laughs> we talked about that last week. Um, the magicians, they also did miracles, and their st staffs turned into snakes as well. And the hardening of Pharaoh's heart and all of that. And um, so, you know, and then all, all the house of Israel turned on Moses. You know, think about him. And, of course, we read the story. God was speaking to him time and time again. Go, do this. And he was obeying. But it got worse and worse and worse for Moses. So it's not an easy walk. Uh, uh, obeying and following the Lord by any means. And for us, it's such a help studying these stories, feeding on these stories, because they apply to our life's battles as well. So today, a reminder to us that God is for us. Now, in Exodus chapter 10, we start at verse one, a really interesting verse. And this time a year ago, I brought out a really important uh, point that English makes a huge mistake. Read chapter 10, verse one. And the Lord said to Moses, go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants that I might show these my signs in the midst of them. So you'll read, it says that the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh. Well, guess what, everyone? The Hebrew word is not go. In the past, the other times that the Lord has said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, it is the word go. It's lech. It's the same word that God said to Abraham, get out of your country, go. But here, it's a totally different word. It's not the word go. It's the word in Hebrew, Bo, it's the word come, come to Moses. So what's the difference between go and come, everyone? So most of the ancient rabbis and sages, they would say the big difference is that now God is going as well. And the Lord is saying to Moses, you're not going by yourself this time. You're coming with me. 
come with me. Guys, now God has decided he is going with Moses. So look out, Pharaoh, when the Lord turns up. And this is a really important point. You may think, okay, what's the big deal? It's such a small, insignificant thing. No, it's not. Because here's the point. Pharaoh has hardened his heart time and time and time again. Guess what? The same thing that I was talking about before the Bible study. We have said to Hezbollah, don't attack us. Don't test our patience. And they have hardened their heart. They have kept on firing missiles at us. So guess what we're going to do? It looks like we're going. Now, I'm not comparing and saying God is going with us, but I'm going to tell you that our, our uh, prime minister, our defense minister, our chief of staff, they have said, you've seen what we've done to the Gaza Strip. We will do the same to South Lebanon if you don't stop. So there comes a time when God, he gives grace. He gives grace. He gave grace to, to Pharaoh time and time again. And Pharaoh kept on hardening his heart. And we're going to talk about what that means, hardening his heart. And now God is saying to Moses, not go, but bo. In Hebrew, which means come. Come with me. I'm going. I want you to come with me. So I wonder how Moses felt when he heard the change in the invitation. Instead of go, go alone, which is in itself is a scary thing to go. Uh, and, and remember who Pharaoh was. He was the he was God's representative on the on the earth in the culture of that day. But now when when God slips in that word come. Wow, I wonder how empowered that uh, that um, made Moses feel. I'm not going alone. God is, not only God is going with me, I'm going with God. And we've talked about this in the past weeks. Remember the, um, remember the, the, that concept in the Bible? Sometimes God says, uh, follow me. Sometimes he says, walk with me. And other times he says to Abraham, walk before me. And up until now, Moses has been walking before the Lord. He's been the sent one. But now he's going with the Lord. And uh, this is, uh, you know, I feel sorry for, for uh, Pharaoh right now. But on the other hand, I don't feel sorry for him. He had chance after chance after chance. And um, now, by the way, if you go to verse, uh, the middle of page one in your notes, Exodus 10, verse three, and Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. It seems that that was the problem that Pharaoh had, humbling himself. Now, why was that such a problem? Because, by the way, uh, during this passage, uh, Pharaoh actually makes a declaration. He says, I have sinned. Right now, we've come to about nine plagues. And remember, Egypt was getting attacked. The missiles that were firing were not from the IDF. They were from the Lord himself. Uh, and he was firing down these missiles, frogs, gnats, lice, fire, blood, you name it. And uh, so Egypt was, you know, getting a, a battering. And even the magicians and the wise men, they said to Pharaoh, let them go. Even they could see clearly. But why was Pharaoh struggling, uh, humbling himself here? Well, how bad would it have looked if he had said to these group of slaves, in the eyes of all of his wise men, in the eyes of all of his military leaders, in the eyes of all of the surrounding nations that paid tribute to Egypt, remember they were the superpower of the world, how bad would that have looked? Him letting a group of 
Hebrew slaves uh, get get the uh, diplomatic uh, 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 brownie points over on the you know the the king of Egypt and the king of the world at the time. So his he, his pride. And um, and that was the accusation that Moses and Aaron came and said, thus says the Lord God of Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. And we could we could uh, study pride uh, for a long time, but just a few things that why do people. Why do people dig their heels and what's really behind pride? There can be so many things. Sometimes, um, you know, like I've just tried to paint the picture, what other people will think of me if I humble myself? I will lose face in the eyes of other people. And it's not an easy thing for some people to do, to let go of something. Other people's ma people manifest uh, things like bitterness or unforgiveness, or they have a victim mentality, um, and that is a form of a pride instead of letting go. I'm sure there's at least some of us here who have at least one member of their family whether it's a, a direct member or whether it's an extended member of a family, that there is a interpersonal conflict going on with that person. And maybe we're the guilty one, actually. And pride is a tough one to overcome, you know, to let go of the offense or to let go of what happened. Um, it's not an easy thing. And, and, and it, it's, a, it's a painful thing, even the thought of letting that go. But I believe this is higher ground that, that uh, we are called. And after all, this is what God's mercy is when he forgives us. He has the high ground. And the cross is all about uh, forgiveness and mercy. And... Um, so just something to think about, and we can maybe probe that deeper a little bit later. But Moses and Aaron are faced here with someone that will not harden their hearts. And of course, that leads us to the question, how do we handle someone in the same uh, situation? Um, or, or what about when the Lord himself desensitizes people's hearts. See, here's the thing, everyone. That phrase, Pharaoh hardened his heart, that's mentioned, but there are other cases where it mentions that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. So what is it? Is it Pharaoh hardening his heart? Or is it God hardening the heart of Pharaoh? And the best interpretation I've heard of that, I've heard of, is that the person, they are responsible. It's not God. But when they carry on the same path and they keep hardening and they keep hardening and they get warning after warning after warning, signs from heaven, attacks on their health, attack on here, attack on there. You know, isn't God saying something? And they keep doing it. Then the Lord, he gives that person over to the hardening of their heart. And so in a literary sense, God is hardening that person's heart. He's giving them over. Or to use different terminology, Paul says this in Romans chapter one at the end of the bottom of page one in your notes. The wrath of God. This is what Paul said 2000 years ago, everyone. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness or godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, 
God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Here we go, verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, here's the second time, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for the error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, here's the third time, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Sounds to me like Hamas. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Sounds like the United Nations. So that's that was written 2,000 years ago. What interesting insight Paul had. Obviously, he, did, he had done a bit of historical uh, uh, history uh, uh, study. Maybe he was referring to the time of Noah, maybe he was referring to a different time period, but uh, when he wrote to the church at uh, Thessalonica, he said this, he said, they, people perish because they refuse to love the truth and be saved. For this reason, God sends a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth, but have delighted in wickedness. Now, in that same chapter, everyone, Paul calls this the great falling away. And you've probably heard of that. The Greek word is apostasia, which is where we get the word apostasy. And it's written to the believers. And it's something that is going to attack the church. What we just read in Romans 1, and 2 Thessalonians is going to be attacking the church, the great falling away. People who cannot stand sound doctrine, who know God, who know the truth, who know what's right and wrong. Now, what are the examples of what I'm talking about? I'll give you three great examples. The three universities in the United States where the heads of those universities couldn't even answer that simple question. Our calls for the genocide of the Jewish people, um, what was the question? Are they uh, um, insightful or not? And they couldn't even, that's what I call a uh, deluded mind. And one of them ad admitted, they admitted after the first lady that resigned, she admitted that, um, you know, I had been seduced. Seduced. Seducing spirits. 2 Timothy 4.1, I think, or 1 Timothy 4.1, that in the last days, the spirit says, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. 
This is the language. So um, Pharaoh was a wise man, a smart guy. The wisdom of the Egyptians, you, you didn't become the superpower of the world, the leader of that superpower, by being stupid. He obviously was a smart man, and yet, and yet, uh, he, was, he was so blind by his pride. And, uh, you know, God's wrath, just like Paul says, God's wrath was about to be poured out on Egypt. So I'm not going to go on more about this point, but I hope I've painted a picture of how Paul and how the story in Exodus looks when God warns and warns and warns, and then he gets to a place where, okay, enough. And this is coming on the church, even on believers, everyone who open themselves up to liberal theology, be careful because the enemy, he it doesn't happen overnight that we wake up and we realize, you know what, I want to be a woman if you're a man. It doesn't happen overnight. Usually it's, it you know, things like that, they play on your mind. Or I don't know if I believe in the resurrection of Jesus anymore. These are th liberal theologians. People usually, they play around with it. They wrestle with these things. And there's nothing wrong with wrestling. I mean, when when you get a, 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 when you get these thoughts, sometimes they're from the devil. So it's not like we need to feel guilty about that. It's what we do with it. And that's what it says in 2 Corinthians. Uh, it says we are to cast down every thought and imagination and bring it to the obedience of Christ and to his word. We've got them. If we're not sure, we've got to keep going, coming back to God's word and make sure it lines up with God's word. Uh, you know, I've always felt like I'm a little bit of a woman. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, no, the, what does God's word say about it? Male and female, he created them. No, I'm either a male or if it doesn't line up with God's word then you, we got to reject these ideas. And so this is, this is the battle for our minds and the battle for our souls. Now, before the Lord was going to bring the 10th plague, we get to the plague of the locusts. And I, I've singled this out, the top of page three, chapter 10, verse 14. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested in all the coasts of Egypt. Very grievous they were. Before them, there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such, for they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened and they did eat every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. And there remained not any green thing in the trees or in the herbs of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Egypt is huge. Can you imagine that? Seeing a, an army of locusts. I've only seen it in, in movies. I've never seen it live, but a fascinating sight. Verse 16, then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste, and he said, I have sinned. Here, here we go. He admits it. I have sinned against the Lord, your God, and against you. Now, therefore, forgive, I pray thee. My, my sin only this once, only this once, and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. And he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. By the way, that verse 18, which says about Moses, and he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. Some of the rabbis interpret that by saying he turned and left. And that's just a interpretation because in those days, um, you didn't turn your back on any leaders, but uh, some of the rabbis think that uh, Moses, this is where the table started to turn because now we have a humbled Pharaoh. Until then, he wouldn't humble himself. Now he's got him at a weak spot. Doesn't really that matter that much. Verse 19, and the Lord turned a mighty strong west wind which took away the locusts and cast them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the coasts of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart 
so that he would not let the children of Israel go. So the real damage that is happening here, everyone, is not just God sending locusts for the sake of sending locusts. Uh, we talked about this the other week when I mentioned that these plagues were an attack on the gods of Egypt. Uh, there was a locust god. When they saw all those locusts, they believed that that was a god. Just like when they saw the sun, that was a god. The Nile, that was a god. Thousands and thousands of gods, like in India. Today, there's over a million gods. Everything is a god. But what, in effect, is happening here, everyone, is the economy of Egypt is being severely attacked because you've got no green. You've got no produce. Long gone are the days of Joseph where all the barns were stored up. They were the good days. And maybe, maybe when the trees and the shrubs and the plants were being attacked, maybe this pharaoh, as he's sitting there looking at it all happening, Remember, the, the narrative of this whole story started, a king rose up who did not know Joseph. And that can be interpreted that he didn't want to know anything about Joseph. He didn't want any emotional connection to what Joseph did, because by now the Hebrews had grown and multiplied. So in any event, he had hardened his heart and now his economy now, think about it. You've, you've got all those soldiers. They, they've got to provide for their families. You've got to give them their salaries, their wages. Uh, you've got to get food and, uh, for, for the horses um, to carry those chariots. This is a severe attack on the economy of, uh, of Egypt. Kind of almost similar to what happened at the beginning of the russia ukrainian war remember when it first broke out overnight nato and the allies put an economic uh sanction on russia and it really they tried to hit them hit their economy sadly to say it hasn't really affected them because they have so much reserves the russians in any event um just a few interesting insights into locusts, just as a matter of interest, anyone. Locusts were not just um, uh, uh, not just weapons of destruction. Locusts actually were used for good things. Uh, they were used for uh, medicine, for the treatment of rheumatism and back pain. They help treat delayed growth in children. If any of you are like me and you're still short, maybe there's hope for us yet. Uh, it's also used as an effective stimulant for sexual needs for the elderly. I'm not going to tell anyone to put their hands up for that one. They are high in protein, zinc, and iron, which are essential for immunity, growth, and health. And they are low in greenhouse gas emissions compared to other animal sources of protein. John the Baptist, remember, that was part of his diet in Matthew 3, verse 4. Now, John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. That John himself ate of grasshoppers and locusts from time to time is clear. Many Jews, both before and after John and the Essenes, they ate these kind of insects. So like at the, the community at Qumran, the Essenes. And, uh, but what's interesting in these, this passage in uh, Matthew 3 is the absence of some qualification of what kind of locusts John ate or how he ate them. Because there are different kinds. There are kosher and unkosher. So Matthew and uh, uh, Mark doesn't actually mention what kind of locusts, just for those that are interested in digging deeper into the scriptures, because um, obviously they didn't really have any intent to speak into the 
uh, culture of the day in, in on those issues. Alfred Eidersheim states that Tutmos II is the only pharaoh's mummy to display cysts, possible evidence of plagues that spread through the Egyptian and Hittite empires at that time. So it's just a little bit of information about locusts and the importance of them. Uh, we know how destructive they can be, but they were also sold in markets um, as well. So it was a double whammy on Egypt, this particular uh, plague. Now, Pharaoh's heart hardened, but then he softened again. Look what happened in chapter 10, verse 24. Pharaoh then summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Go serve the Lord, only your flocks and your herds we will keep. We will detain them. Even your little ones may go with you. Now, basically he's saying you can go. Moses, take your people, take your little ones. But your flocks and your herds, they must remain. Now, before we read the next verse, because there's something, I only saw this yesterday and it just hit me so strong. Moses at this point, if I was Moses, I would have kept my mouth shut. I would have said, really? You're letting us go? Okay, that's a good deal. It's a good deal. You keep our cattle, we can go. I like the price of our freedom. But Moses didn't buy that. Look what he said in response. But Moses replied, you also must give us sacrifices and burnt offerings to make to the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not an animal must be left behind. For some of them we will select for the service of the Lord our God. But we will not know with which ones are to serve the Lord until we arrive there. Guys, what's going on? Remember, there's no temple in Egypt. There's no tabernacle in Egypt. There's no priesthood in Egypt. Where did Moses get this idea that when they get out of Egypt and they come into the desert, that they have to sacrifice to the Lord? Where did they get it from? Remember, it's 400 years after Joseph. And Joseph's father, Jacob, and his grandfather, Isaac, and his great-grandfather, Abraham. We know from the stories that wherever those patriarchs moved around, they built altars unto the Lord. And they sacrificed. They called on the name of the Lord. So for 400 years, when they were in Egypt, the Israelites, they must have talked about it. They must have shared it as they were sitting around the fireplaces playing on their banjos or whatever they played and uh, their harmonicas. But um, they must have had a concept. Look at Moses' response. We've got to use these animals for the service of the Lord. Guys, the point is this. Moses was more, it, it wasn't just freedom that concerned him. He could have taken that freedom. It wasn't just freedom. It was the Lord. He was soul-hearted, soul-focused on not just the freedom, but taking God with him. And the idea, he must have learned this from his forefathers. Now, think about it. Moses had this vision of getting out. He saw himself and the Israelites getting out of Egypt without any animals, no altars, no sacrifices, no religion, and it must have concerned him. And the brilliant vision and deep spiritual, or rather the high spirituality of Moses, to see that in the spirit, the need for these animals, guys, the need for blood, this is a deep spiritual insight that Moses had, and it just blew me away as I was reading this. The, the, the spirituality of Moses to see this. Guys, it's the same for you and me. We can have our freedom. 
We can climb the ladders of success in our profession. We can make as much money or fame or whatever. But what good is it if we don't have an altar, if we don't have a place that we draw near to God, if we're not taking God with us, if we don't have a vision for the service of the Lord? That's what it says. Let's read again. Verse 26. Our livestock also must go with us. Not an animal must be left behind. For some of them we will select for the service of the Lord our God. He had a vision for a priesthood. A spiritual priesthood. Bringing us. The priests were to bring us closer to God. That's what all sacrifice is for. Guys, it may sound foolish. Like Paul says, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, foolish. But unto us, it is the power of God. The altars, the animals, the sacrifices, the blood. This has to be taken with us everywhere we go. That's why I, I don't really like giving credit to the crusaders. But when they went to battle, they took uh, the, the flag of the cross. And the cross was to remind them of the shed blood. I don't know how I don't know how deep they took that with them, but it was supposed to remind them of the blood of Calvary. And that's why we wear crosses and why churches have crosses to remind us of the need for sacrifice and for blood. So think about that, everyone. Think about what's on the top of your list in your prayer. Is it freedom? Is it the salvation of someone? Is it. Uh, you know, a higher pay or whatever. I think Moses, he put the number one thing on his list, not freedom, not freedom, but taking God wherever he went. Now, one other thing about that is he also took with him, because in another passage, uh, it's at, at one stage, uh, I think Pharaoh wouldn't, let either the the older or the younger ones, I think he said, keep the older ones behind. Correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, he he said not, not anyone will be left behind, the young or the old. And the importance, because if we leave the old behind, then we don't have the wisdom of the old ones to carry through to the next generation. And if we leave the young ones behind, then we have no one to carry the flag for the next generation. In fact, in Judaism, whenever they were driven out of one place to another and they would come into a new shtetl or area, wherever they came, the two main things, the first two things they looked for or they built when they arrived Number one was a hospital, and number two was a school. The hospitals for the sick and the elderly, and the schools for the young people, the old and the young. So whatever camp we're in, guys, we don't leave. And, and I've seen this in churches. When pastors, they get a new pastor that comes uh, appointed, and that church is dying. You know what they do? Sometimes, in order to move on, they think we've got to aim for the young people only, and they sacrifice the old people. They say, we've got to move on. And so they throw out all the old hymns, they throw out all the old traditions, and they think they're doing a good idea, only thinking of the young. And I've seen it many times. I was a part of a church. So many old people got so hurt. They'd been at that church for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It's an old Baptist church in New Zealand. So uh, these takeovers have to be done with a lot of wisdom. We can't leave the elderly behind and we can't leave the young behind. We need wisdom for both. And now, guys, we're, as we come kind of to the climax of the whole story, we come to the killing of the firstborn son. Nine plagues have struck Egypt, and now 
the death judgment is coming on Egypt. And this has a negative, the judgment, but it also has the positive because this is where the Israelites are redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Exodus 12, verse 5, the top of page 5. Your lamb, this is what the Lord is commanding every Israelite home. Your lamb must be a year old and without blemish. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You will keep it until the 14th day of this month. And then with the whole community of Israel assembled, it will be slaughtered during the evening twilight. They will take some of its blood and apply it to the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they eat it. They will consume its meat that same night, eating it roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or even boiled in water, but roasted with its head and shanks and inner organs. You must not keep any of it beyond the morning. Whatever is left over in the morning must be burned up. This is how you are to eat it, with your loins girt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You will eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For on this same night I will go through Egypt, striking down every firstborn in the land, human being and beast alike, and executing judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I, the Lord, but for you, the blood will mark the houses where you are. Seeing the blood, I will pass over you. Thereby, when I strike the land of Egypt, no destructive blow will come upon you. So this was the command, and it was fulfilled. Look at verse 29 in the same chapter, chapter 12. And so at midnight, the Lord struck down every firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the firstborn of the prisoner in the dungeon, as well as all the firstborn of the animals. Pharaoh rose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was loud wailing throughout Egypt, for there was not a house without its dead. Reminds me, remember the Cecil B. DeMille movie, The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston and Yul Brunner. Remember Yul Brunner? He played Pharaoh. And I, I remember the scene when he had his dead son with him. And Charlton Heston, Pharaoh, uh, Moses came in. And uh, it was a sad uh, scene. Now, let me bring out the special place of the firstborn in that culture, everyone. The death of the firstborn represents God's righteous judgment on Egypt, who would hurt his firstborn. Who was God's firstborn son? It was Israel. Read chapter 4, verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So this was a, Pharaoh knew, Pharaoh heard from Moses that Israel was the almighty creator's firstborn son. So this in a way represents God's righteous judgment on those who would hurt God's firstborn son. Number one. Number two, in biblical times, the firstborn was given certain unique rights, responsibilities, and privileges. A married couple's firstborn male child was given priority and preeminence in the family and the best of the inheritance. I'm at the top of page six. People in the ancient cultures attached great value to the eldest son assigning him distinct benefits and obligations. The firstborn male was important because he was believed to represent the prime of human strength and vitality. Let me say that sentence again. The firstborn male was important because he was believed to represent the prime of human strength and vitality. For example, 
when Jacob blessed his 12 sons in Genesis 49 verse 3, look what he said to Reuben, who was the firstborn. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, excelling in honor, excelling in power. And Psalm 78, 51, he struck down all the firstborn of Egypt, the first fruits of manhood in the tents of Ham. That's an interesting uh, insight that the psalmist had. The firstborn of Egypt. The firstborn son became the primary heir of the family. The firstborn's birthright involved a double portion of the household estate and the leadership of the family. If the father became incapacitated or was absent for some reason. And the other thing about the striking of the firstborn, everyone, is I've mentioned this before. In Egypt, Pharaoh, he was God. He was God to the world and to the people of Egypt. His son was being lined up to be the next God. So this was a strike on another one of Egypt's gods. Now, it wasn't just humans. Animals also were told, or rather the owners were told, to hand over the firstborn of the animals as well. Look at uh, a, a passage from Leviticus 27, 26. But a firstborn of animals, which as a firstborn belongs to the Lord. No man may dedicate, whether ox or sheep, it is the Lord's. And I think we could discuss a lot about why even animals, as well as humans, why is that firstborn dedicated? I, I think of um, something in the line of, you know, that firstborn, that, that symbol of my first strength, my first child, the, the danger of getting so caught up and over proud and over almost worshiping that child who you're going to raise up to carry so much. But the Lord says, no, it's almost like a protection by saying, you give him to me. He belongs to me. It's almost like a protection. And it's like a giving up, giving that person to and that animal to the Lord. Because the same can happen if you're a farmer and you're dependent economically on your cattle and on your sheep and you think hey i've got my first uh uh cow or calf and uh, it's going to be a good year but, but but then you read leviticus and you say okay god i'm going to give this to you as a reminder that uh, i'm not to get overconfident in my flocks or in my my possessions but you are the one who blesses and and makes me to prosper now a question everyone we are we were told to put the blood and i asked this question this time last year we were told to put the blood on the lintels of the house and when the angel of death sees the blood he will pass over so my question which i asked last year is did they put the blood on the inside of the door or on the outside of the door? Do you remember we, we wrestled a little bit with this last year? And um, and the other question is, is, did they need faith? All they needed to do was put the blood. Did they really need faith? And, uh, you know, so these are just fun kind of questions, but interesting questions. Because why is that an interesting question? Did, was the blood on the inside or on the outside? Was it something only the people as they were sitting inside? Remember, when we celebrate Passover every year at the Seder table, the idea is we are to sit at that table as if we are in Egypt. And we're try, we're, we try to live it out as if we are at the night of the angel of death. 
So just imagine you're sitting in a home, your home, you've got that lamb, you're eating that lamb, and you put blood on the do on the doorpost inside. Let's say it's on the inside. You see that blood. Outside is where all the damage and the destruction. And yet, when the angel sees the blood, so what are you thinking as you're sitting inside? Are you thinking, is this really going to work? <laughs> no. Is was Did Moses eat too many locusts this morning, giving us this idea to put blood on our doorposts? And he's been out in the desert too much, I think. Um, and uh, so what are you thinking as you're seeing that blood? And then what about outside? If you put it on the outside, what might you be thinking? You might be thinking, you know, this could be a threat to the Egyptians. Maybe this might anger them. And especially if it works, they're going to know that we put that blood up and that our firstborn were spared. And that might anger them and they may come after us afterward. Kind of almost like putting a cross outside of your house if you live in in uh, in Iran or Iraq or a you know a Muslim nation or a communist nation, whatever. So um, just food for thought, everyone. Think about it. The you're sitting there, and and the whole idea of faith as you're sitting in that home. What are you depending on? Are you de you're in some ways we're depending on that blood. Because that was the command. Put that blood on your doorposts. So there is a, an element of faith there. Anyhow, when the Lord saw that blood, or rather the angel of death, came and passed over that house. Guys, you know what this is? This is Yeshua. That's the Hebrew word for salvation this was the moment of israel's salvation the firstborn was struck the firstborn of all those ones that had the blood on the posts they were saved and we do this throughout every generation but we know that there's a greater uh fulfillment of the story don't we and we'll get to that in just a second. But before we get to it, there's something else in the story that I just want to touch on. It wasn't just the blood on the doorpost. There was another command. They were commanded to eat the lamb, eat every single part of the lamb, and to have your loins girded and your staff in your hand and your sandals on. What's the point, everyone? Guys, they had a journey before them. They needed the blood, and they needed the strength of eating that lamb. They had a long journey ahead. They needed that protein. And let me tell you, if that lamb is as good as the New Zealand lamb where I come from, because they have about 80 million sheep in New Zealand, at least that's how much they said when I grew up, it was good. So, uh, but it's, it's you know, very high in protein. And uh, the idea is that it gave them strength for the journey. So, you know, and, and, and by the way, that's a picture. I think that's a really good picture of this word Yeshua, salvation. This is a big word. What does salvation really mean? Is it a one, you know, is it a one-off thing for the Israelites that they just put the blood on the posts? No, because they had that journey. They had to go through the wilderness. They had a destination, and that destination was a promise, the, the, the promised land. So salvation, in a way, we know what happened when they got into the wilderness. And we're going to touch on that. Uh, in the coming weeks and when we get into the book of Numbers. They sure needed salvation 
not from Egypt, but they needed to get Egypt out of themselves. And that's the other side of salvation. And like I said, this all points to something in the future that actually on the banks of Jordan, John the Baptist, when he saw this man from Nazareth come into the Jordan River, remember what he said? He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Where did he get that revelation? The Lamb of God. Who calls someone the Lamb of God? Someone that had an understanding of their Bible, who understood what the Lamb and the blood represented. But also Paul, you know what he calls Yeshua, Jesus? Look what it says in Colossians 1.18. He said he is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So that he himself will come to have first place in everything. He didn't just die as the Lamb of God, but he was risen from the dead and he's called the firstborn, meaning he's God's first strength. He has the preeminence of everyone. And he's our head. We're connected to him. We are his body. He is our head. We are connected to him and his life in his resurrection. Remember, guys, the cross. When we think of the blood of Yeshua, the blood of Jesus, we not only think of it in his death, but when he rose from the death, and he lives in us. Remember what he said. You are, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, metaphorically, you have no place. You will not abide in me. We need, just like the Israelites had to put that blood over to protect them from death, they also needed to eat the lamb for the journey ahead. And when we drink his blood, metaphorically, at the Seder or at the communion, what we're saying is we're saying, God, my blood, I need a transfusion. My blood is corrupted. It's from my forefather, Adam. I need new blood. I need new life. I need your life. The spotless lamb, undefiled. Remember, the lamb had to be offered up undefiled. His blood, everyone. Is undefiled. So when, the next time you have communion, the Lord's Supper, and you and we'll we'll talk about this when we get to the book of Leviticus. We are drinking by faith his blood, which is his very life, his resurrected life. And that's why Paul says in Romans 8 17, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with the Messiah Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we also may be glorified with him. As Israel came out, everyone, God even gave them a dowry. They didn't leave empty handed. In chapter 12, verse 40, 35, the Israelites did as Moses had commanded. They asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and clothing. Indeed, the Lord had made the Egyptians so well disposed toward the people that they let them have whatever they asked for. And so they despoiled the Egyptians. Guys, this was God restoring the Israelites for the 400 years of slavery. And there's a beautiful promise in Joel 2.25 which God says, I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. A reference to the locusts. Guys, apply that to your life. God is with us in our walk of freedom. This is all about being set free to worship God. Not being set free for freedom itself, but being set free to worship God to get our lives in order. And like Moses, when he came out, he said, no, I won't leave without the animals, without the service. We need an altar. We need a place every day 
we come before the Lord. And God promised that he's going to do that to the people of Israel in the future. In Jeremiah 31, 9, they will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. There's the reference. And you know what? As I read that, I got to be honest with you, since this war started and what happened on October the 7th, you know, my mindset was, God, how could you allow that to happen? And my faith was shaken. Aren't we your chosen people? And yet this is just this verse just reminded me. Ephraim is my firstborn son. Yes, he allows a Pharaoh to rise up who did not know Joseph. We suffered 400 years of persecution, of slavery. But God did not forget his promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And what he has promised, he will keep. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And may all the house of Israel proclaim one, one day that they may know that Yeshua, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And it's going to happen in Zechariah 12.10. It says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for one as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. So guys, maybe today God is saying, go, walk before me. And maybe he's saying, like he said to Moses, Bo, come, come with me. This is a radical passage. And I think we're at that place here in Israel. Like I said at the beginning, we've warned and we've warned and we've warned our enemies, our neighbors. And now it's like, okay, it's almost like God is going to, I hope God is going with us. In any event, whatever happens along the way, we know that God will ultimately bring us salvation. Even, even when we die, when we have the blood, what did Yeshua, Jesus say in John 11? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And that's the power of believing in the blood of the lamb. We're all going to die. But there's that promise of after death, the free gift of God, which is eternal life through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Messiah and Lord. Amen. Amen. Outstanding teaching. Oh, Ron, you did a great job. <laughs> As always. I love that you brought up that passage in Joel because I don't know how many times I've read that and never noticed that it was referring to the years that the locusts had destroyed Egypt because apparently it took several years for them to recoup, right, from the, all of that damage. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. And then, you know, when you read the word or watch the movies, either way, you kind of get the impression that Moses went in and came out. Then he went in with the next plague and came out. But apparently that took a whole year, like from spring to spring, which is why we have Passover, you know, in the spring. But, you know, I always just thought it was like a week or 10 days, right? <laughs> yeah, it was a long struggle, a long battle. Yeah. So, wow. I can imagine the people being so discouraged. <laughs> yeah. So everybody unmute yourself. If you have any comments or questions.
Well, if no one has, that's fine, because I know Gary's got something to share. So, Gary. Good teaching. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Um, so at the, at the conclusion of this parasha, Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt, and the Lord gives them the ordinance of the Pesach, of the Passover. Thus the Lord did all he had promised. Not one word that the Lord has spoken was left unfulfilled. Reminding ourselves of this truth helps us also to trust in God's faithfulness, his power, and mercy now in the days to come. Today, the Jewish people still celebrate this miraculous Passover each year. Exodus 12, 14 says, So this day shall be to you a memorial. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinances. And that's a that and that's that's a direct command from God. Individual believers and entire churches are increasingly commemorating the Passover as well, since it foreshadows Yeshua, the Messiah, the Lamb of God who was sacrificed in order to spare us from the judgment of God. So it's because of God's enduring mercy that he brought each one of us out of the darkness and that held us captive. I'm going to end by this, this scripture verse. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. And brought Israel out of the uh, out from among them. His love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, Lelem Hasdo, his love endures forever. Psalm 136. Amen. That's the, the psalm we we read every Passover, right, Gary? Yes, sir. Absolutely. You bet. Yeah. Thank you for those uh those words. Well, um, does anybody have any last comments or we can pray? Are you going to celebrate Tupi Shvat <laughs> coming Wednesday? Yes. Yes, um, I will. Um, tree planting, uh, for those who don't know, yes. And I'll probably plant a tree uh, in honor of my mother. Yeah. If you send me her full name, because I still have the paperwork i was going to send it in but i need her i think it's her full name it's just ruth she didn't have a middle name strangely oh okay it my just... mother didn't either yeah interesting a jewish thing i guess <laughs> no, i know lots of jewish people have oh most... really yeah. Huh. yeah anyway all right um let's pray everyone close off and then gary can uh, bless us Father God, we we do thank you for these reminders from your word. And um, I pray that we would take, take your word and apply it to our lives and walk it out. And uh, Lord, as we think of the, this whole concept of salvation as a not just an event, but as a process that, like Paul said, we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it God who works uh, in you to to accomplish his purposes. So help us walk it out, Lord. And uh, thank you for the freedom that you give us. And thank you that you are with us and you are for us. And uh, Lord, even when we go through those uh, struggles and trials, when you say to us, go, uh, and it feels lonely and it feels scary and it feels vulnerable. But Lord, ultimately, you're, you're with us. And there comes a time that you say, come, come with me, where you start to move on our behalf. So help us to stand our ground to, um, as Paul said, to wage war as a good soldier. Lord, give us the strength, give us the, the oil, give us the spirit. Give us the, the power that we need to fight this fight. Help us to lift each other's arms up in this battle, this which is raging, not just here in Israel, the physical battle, but the spiritual battle, the internal struggle that we all go through. But we do thank you for your word that you've given us as uh, not just a lamp and a light, but as a sword. And we pray that you would... Um, continue to train us up to be good fighters that as what does the psalmist say it is God who trains my hands 
for battle. My, my arms can bend a bow of bronze. So thank you for, for this word and for this study in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 If you all please unmute. Before I give the blessing, John Hodges, for my brother, is there anything you want to share at all that's in your heart? Well, you caught me off guard, but uh, um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm on earphones here. It's uh, everybody else is in bed here, so um, I'm at uh, Volcano National Park. Uh, uh, a couple that I befriended on my last tour live right next door, so um, it's where I'm at in Hawaii right now. But uh, I just Continue to pray for Israel. Um, I saw a thing this week that uh, Hamas made some of the captives change into their uh, Arab civilian clothes, and then they killed them. And uh, the idea that was in charge of labeling the bodies uh, were also commanded that they were also to tend to Arab bodies that they found, not just Jewish bodies. That's how they discovered that some of these Jewish people uh, that had died, they thought were Arabs, were actually Jewish, that uh, the Hamas made them change their clothes. So again, it's just what Israel's dealing with and the deception uh, in the war, just to, to keep praying. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 Receive his blessing. Yivarechacha denai v'nish v'necha, Ye'er denai p'navalecha v'chonecha, Yisad denai p'navalecha v'esimlecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his guidance upon each and every one of you and fill you to overflowing with his shalom, with his peace. Hashem Adonai Yeshua HaMashiach. In the name of our Lord, Jesus the Messiah. And in our Lord, Moshi Enu our Redeemer, Pelio Ed's wonderful counselor, El Gibor, mighty God, Aviad, everlasting Father, Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Abinu Mokenu, our Father and our King, our El Shaddai, our all sufficient God. Do you know how God's people says? Amen. 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 Bless you, my